I think in this case, it seems like Natasha has tried to tick so many boxes that she's almost taken away too much of certain things to improve the effectiveness of other things. Natasha has a new guide and we're bloody well going to talk about it. So this actually popped up in the old comments on the DMs recently, where everyone's saying, Harry, can you have a look at Natasha's new move guide sort of thing? I've looked at a few of Natasha's guides, actually. My, my kind of views in that sense have always been relatively consistent in the sense that I've always thought they were good. I think Natasha puts a lot of attention to detail into her guides. She's obviously very science-based, which I love to see. And I think they tick a lot of boxes. But there are also a few areas where Natasha, I, in my personal opinion, kind of falls a bit short. And that's that's kind of going to be elaborated on later and I'm also going to give a reason as to why that might be occurring but I don't obviously don't want to give too much away otherwise you're not going to watch my video and then you're going to turn off and then tell me you hate me. Before we crack on with the video we're going to crack on with the video. If any point throughout this video you decide you actually like the video maybe even maybe learn something actually or maybe even laugh potentially who knows it doesn't matter if you're laughing with me or at me either one counts then please do consider liking the video because 1300 likes is the goal. If at any point you also like any of the things I'm saying and just actually don't hate me and borderline tolerate me and think well harry you're cool and obviously no one thinks that but i can pretend then please do consider subscribing to the channel by clicking the red button down below and maybe also tickling the bell next to it so you get notified when i upload every week twice a week on a monday and a thursday and if you have any questions you want me to answer at the end of like the next video perhaps then drop it down below in the comment section for comment question of the week and i should do so obviously sticking with the theme of halloween spooky season stuff on my head oh it's out of shot but it basically i think they're kind of cute they're ghosts i'm gonna be honest with you the color is pretty consistent i am as pale as a ghost that's crazy a few things i want to go through is obviously i cannot show the whole guide i'm gonna show segments of it because for legal reasons i don't want to get punched in the face shout out lean beef patty for trying to file legal action against me for reviewing her guide and not being very happy with it this is the guide again i'm just gonna go through a bits and bobs we're gonna talk about it then we're actually going on to the actual workout side of things so the big thing about this guide as natasha speaks it's strength, power, muscle, and athleticism. So it is basically a combination of a lot of things. It's almost like a jack of all trades guide. And that's something I think a lot of people need to remember because ultimately, if you have a liter of water, in a cup, a big cup, obviously quite a big cup for a litre, and you have it in that singular cup, that cup is full. If you distribute it across four cups, each cup will only have some water in it. If you focus your training on one goal, you will likely do that goal really well. You have that full litre of water. The more and more goals you try and include, so a bit of this, bit of that, you end up distributing that water across more cups, therefore reducing how effective something could be for a singular goal. If you have one goal, let's your goal is powerlifting, you will train for powerlifting, and therefore your, your program will be specific to powerlifting and will be optimized for powerlifting. If you want to power build, so it's powerlifting and bodybuilding, you almost reduce how effective it is for powerlifting to increase how effective it is for bodybuilding. So not being great at either, but good at both, if that makes sense. Splitting across multiple goals does potentially reduce effectiveness of workouts. But if your goal is to get better at all of these things, arguably that is effective. So the way Natasha's running is she's doing four workouts followed by one optional workout. And I think that's actually a really good approach. I think the idea of having four primary workouts days a week is really good because people have lives people have jobs people have families people have so many things to do but giving people that optional fifth day also caters for those who do want to train a bit more often and also caters for those who might have a bit more time on some weeks more than others which i think is a really good approach i am a big fan of that and ultimately it does also prioritize the importance of rest which is something i'm going to elaborate on further later and one of the things Natasha's has always done quite well there is she's always spoken about failure training and the importance of failure training in hypertrophy and we kind of know like the green zone of hypertrophy is like zero to four reps in reserve but what Natasha basically says, she kind of puts you in the middle range here of one to three reps away from failure. Arguably, I would actually kind of align with this and say it's almost better to kind of go below that four reps because we know people are notoriously bad at gauging how close to failure they actually are. So if someone thinks they're actually three reps from failure, they might actually be four reps from failure. Therefore, Natasha kind of undershooty a bit and saying go to one to three might actually put them in more of a green zone than if they were to go to four, in which they might be out of that green zone due to not knowing where that failure point actually is. So rest times, this is something I have actually mentioned about Natasha's programs before. And the rest times are always, always a bit, I guess it depends. So for the functional side of things, because obviously this does tick a lot of different boxes, I do align what Natasha's saying here. So essentially kind of reducing rest periods for the hit side of things. But when it 
comes to strength and training and hypertrophy training, it goes into another realm in the sense that with strength training, let's say it's like powerlifting or something, you really want to rest for as long as you need to rest. That'll essentially give you the best opportunity to match the performance of the previous set. So with that, I kind of typically say rest for as long as you need to. And from depending on what the movement is and depending on the intensity and a lot of other factors, this also goes into the realm of hypertrophy, is I would typically aim to rest for at least three minutes. And Natasha's saying with the hypertrophy stuff, we kind of want to rest for one to two minutes as that tends to be great. But we actually have a study here which basically compares one minute rest periods versus three minute rest periods. Obviously, like with all studies, there are limitations and weaknesses. For example, this study was conducted using men rather than a mix of different genders. But ultimately, it did come to the conclusion that long rest periods being three minutes were superior to short rest periods being one minute when it comes to increasing muscle strength and hypertrophy so those who rested longer experience better results than those who rested shorter again it really depends on your ability to recover but make sure the local muscle that you're training has recovered so the muscles you're looking at targeting make sure the the kind of secondary muscles have recovered so the muscles you aren't necessarily looking at targeting but are being worked anyway you make sure your breathing is recovered also make sure that psychologically and systemically you are recovered as well and ready to go again or if you tickle those boxes and you're probably in a good spot how long that takes you does depend End, but typically for myself anyway and for a lot of people I do usually say rest for around three plus minutes depending on the movement and the intensity. I love how Natasha speaks about progressive overload where she speaks about just adding a little bit when you can do so. That's what we mean by progressive overload is just doing a little more and progressive overload really typically falls into two areas which is either doing more reps or doing heavier weight. Volume isn't actually really deemed to be a, an element of progressive overload that's more like volume overload which is something different entirely. This is a good time. I like this. I'm really glad that that Natasha has included the importance of progressive overload. And she also included the importance of tracking, how important it is to just track what you're doing. And she really encourages tracking your workouts. How do you know what progressive overload is if you can't remember what you did last week? Whereas if you can track it, you can see, well, actually I did 40 kilos for 10 this week. I think I could probably do 42 and a half kilos for, for 10 again. And let's say you only get nine. Well, next week you can do 42 and a half kilos. But instead of getting nine, you might be able to get 10. Immediately, we've got a few weeks of progressive overload right there. And that's great. I'm really glad Natasha spoke about that. I think sometimes we do need a reminder that in tracking your workouts if you are able to is is really important the nutrition side of things i won't cover too much because natasha just does give basic guidelines which are guidelines i very much actually align with the only one that i kind of was a bit maybe in disagreement with but this is just my personal preference and based on the things i have read is the protein intake so natasha speaks about 0.55 to 0.7 grams per pound of body weight because this is a combination of multiple goals you can maybe understand it but if you are looking at let's say muscle building which inherently kind of falls into two of these goals being hypertrophy and strength then it typically we do often say about one gram per pound of body weight seems to be like a, a safe sweet spot especially with the consideration that if a food claims it's got 100 grams of protein there is a percentage leeway that it might actually have let's say 80 grams of protein so it does maybe help with that that leeway that is occurring that kind of a buffer that kind of food regulations may almost allow in your country depending on where you are and again Natasha really stresses the importance of rest days which is, which is fantastic she talks about priorities outside of training which I love to see and talk about the effect the stress has on the body again love of that leaving us with at least two rest days per week which i think is fantastic I, I typically think training five days a week is probably the most i would probably consider training because I, I do like having two full rest days in a week maybe arguably you could have one rest day but for me personally i don't think that's enough and for you mate you may find that's actually not enough as well but she's obviously giving you the chance of having three rest days but also two rest days if you want to so i think she's bloody nailed that so obviously that's the that's the guide now we're going to actually look at the workouts themselves but again i'm not going to show too much because i don't want to overstep this is based on her app i don't want to disrespect her. I just want to kind of give my opinion on a few things and do a comparison between week one and week 12. For example, we'll look at the lower body featuring strength workout. It's great that she talks about the rough idea of how long each workout is. Again, this will vary depending on your rest periods, but I think it's nice because some people like to know how long they should kind of designate for their workout. So we're starting off with squats, a bloody solid movement. I think it, especially with the strength side of things, I think it's a good movement to include. I think regardless of whether it's strength, I purchase whatever you're doing, I feel like a lot of programs should include a squat variation to some extent be that barbell squats pack squats whatever it may be following diagonal walking lunges seven per side like that whilst we got then we're going to hip thrust another fantastic movement so we're working the quads in their lengthened position here and the glutes in their lengthened position too walking lunges getting the quads and the glutes involved as well we'll go to hip thrust we're now working the glutes in their shortened position bloody fantastic movement kettlebell swings again more the functional side of things i think this is a great movement to include as well pistol squats bloody hard i'll be honest with you there's there used to be a video of me doing pistol squats somewhere and i'll tell you one thing you've never seen a man fall with such a lack of grace and athleticism in his life 
life. It is just a whoop boom. So uh, that won't ever be seeing the light of day because once I don't think I have it anymore. But it's a good thing. I'm doing you a favor. You know, you're welcome. Stiff leg deadlift, again, a fantastic movement. And then we go to overhead duck walks. The thing I always found with duck walks is they're very much a movement that is really going to encourage a lot of burning, but I never kind of really understood how effective they are and for what goal. For hypertrophy side of things, probably not that great. Same strength. Functional, maybe more of a place, but I'm going to be honest with you. The functional side of training, although it's something I am familiar with and I know of because obviously having been a trainer for 10 years or something you, you get to know a bit of a lot of things but it's not something I would ever feel super comfortable actively speak about in extensive detail as opposed to like strength training and hypertrophy training which, which fall more into the realm of things I've actively practiced myself. The issues I found with this is we've got seven exercises here and ultimately I find with that that's the kind of the top end of number of exercises I would do in a day. Like typically I would favor about five to seven exercises. You can do more, you can do less, but that's kind of my sweet spot personally, in most cases anyway. The number of sets does push it a bit far to, for me. So we have a few four sets. Typically I would, I would favor two to three. I think, again, it depends. That's more from the hypertrophy side of things. The functional side of things, I get the importance of higher sets, but this is a lower body workout kind of strength based. And for the strength side of things, I do get the importance of doing more sets. So typically you might do, let's say you could do six sets of squats, depending on what your goals are. Like if you're powerlifting, doing six or eight sets of a movement isn't unheard of, but you would actually typically do not many movements after that. So I think from that side of things, four sets is okay. But for the hypertrophy side of things, I typically peak at about three in most cases. The lack of rep range always kind of gets to me a bit. So if I say do four sets of 12 to three reps in reserve. If you do the first one to three reps in reserve, realistically, your second one won't be to three reps in reserve and nor will the following sets. Again, it's nice that we've got a bit more of a range on like the hip thrust of the 12 and the six and stuff and like the fives and the eights. But typically rather than saying do five, do five, do eight. If it's powerlifting, there's more of a place I would say for saying do sets of five, like five by five, that's fair. But for a lot of cases beyond powerlifting, maybe the accessory side of things and like hypertrophy work, I would then typically say instead of do five, five, eight, eight, I would say five to eight because that allows you to auto-regulate that rep range based on your intensity. So if you want to stick at three reps of reserve for recovery purposes, whatever, if you do eight, then you could do seven, then you could do six, etc., etc. It kind of gives you that freedom and also compensates it. It almost acknowledges and prepares you for inevitable fatigue. Now let's have a look at the same workout, but from week 12. So we looked at week one, let's look at week 12. Immediately we see there's a change in squats. So it's still four sets, but this time it's five, 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 five. Um, five reps is still what they do deem to be like in the hypertrophy rep range as well, but it can also fall into like the, the strength and powerlifting realm as well. That's fine. Tempo hip thrust so this is a new inclusion the argument is why again studies have actually come out i think the studies actually got dropped today i want to say by chris beardsley where he spoke about how time under tension doesn't really yield any noticeable hypertrophy benefits specifically considering the deliberate slowing of the concentric portion of a rep it is largely for hypertrophy not a great time and this movement is likely included for the hypertrophy side of things as it falls into natasha's hypertrophy rep range that she spoke about in the guide itself so the tempo I don't know why. I think with tempo, I think tempos are great to include for technical benefits as some of my clients will know that I program them tempo like deadlifts or squats to help them with the technical side of things, but that's not directly gonna carry over mass amounts to the, the hypertrophy or anything. That is purely for technical purposes. So I'm not sure about the tempo hip thrust. Again, I need more of a justification behind why. Open leg walking lunges. So again, we've kept it kind of similar, just change the variation slightly so it's still a walking lunge variation. Again, the same sort of thing kind of lingers here is that we do have, we do have designated reps and less rep ranges. And you'll notice how some of the movements are changing, but some of them are staying the same. Some key ones are staying in there which I, I like so the squats the hip thrusts a lunge variation the swings and the stiff leg deadlift it's great that they're staying in because effective programs are usually a little bit boring and they don't change a mass amount because you have to repeat movements for weeks on end to get better at them and to progressively overload them and to really kind of yield the most results from them so typically I would try and keep movements relatively the same and the program the same for about 8 to 15 weeks depending on the goals so long enough to get really good at the movements and milk them for all they're worth but not so long we almost risk getting stale with the movements and can almost no longer milk them for what they're worth so it's great that some movements are kept in but I also do understand why some movements have changed but I also don't know if I would necessarily change them I think that's very much dependent on the person and their goals and also whether they can progress that movement anymore which obviously can't really be determined by a PDF workout like this what I would typically do from like a workout plan like this 
is I would start towards the first week where it'd be lower volume, lower intensity. So two sets of things, maybe even one set of things of like four reps in reserve. And then as the weeks progressed, rather than changing the movements around too much, I may, may make a few alterations here and there. I would increase maybe the volume a little bit over the weeks, but also increase the intensity. So we finish like light and low and then we increase as we go. Bloody hell. I am a poet and I didn't even know it. Wow, honestly, what a rhyme. Oh, crazy, honestly. Shakespeare, Shakespeare. The thing is with the upper body workout, we've got things like the pull-ups, good movement, depending on what your goals are. I like that. Renegade road to full extension. Stability is a bit questionable, but it does kind of fall more into the realm of the functional side of things. So I do actually back it here. The bench press, the bench press, because of almost like the risk to reward of it, where you are literally having a bar of your face. I probably do the bench press first and maybe do the pull up second. Medicine ball rotational throw. Yeah, that's a lot more functional. I like that, it's good movement, especially for that rotational power. That's bloody good. Bear sit backs with knee drive, fine. Ring pull to Y, also fine. Kick sits, again, we're maintaining the similar sort of volume of three sets here, maybe the occasional four sets. The rep range thing is still there, consistent reps rather than a rep range. And same with the volume, seven exercises, a lot of sets of each. I do think the volume's a bit excessive. I think that's the issue is when you try and combine a lot of things into one, you risk falling short in certain areas. I think in this case, it seems like Natasha has tried to tick so many boxes that she's almost taken away too much of certain things to improve the effectiveness of other things. I'm not saying Natasha's done anything bad here or wrong here. I'm just saying it kind of highlights my point that I mentioned earlier is when you try and do a lot of things, you, you reduce how effective certain things are for certain areas. Um, is that a spelling mistake? Is that, hang on a second. So good face, is that meant to be a smiley face? Because there's no space here. There's a space there and there's no space there. Oh, I'm not gonna be able to unsee that. Look at it. Yeah, something's going on there. Uh, if we flip over the upper body of week 12, we look, that has changed. We've gone from pull-ups to diamond push-ups to a TRX row, barbell rows, half kneeling kettlebell presses, lateral plank walks, handstand holes. We've actually quite drastically changed this workout entirely, which again begs the question of, of why. Again, I think from the functional side of things, I think changing things more frequently probably has much more of a time and a place. And for the strength side of things, I guess it kind of depends because strength and hypertrophy training follow very similar principles. Movement consistency, movement efficiency, progressive overload, things along those lines. And ultimately it comes down to the fact that I feel like it could be better structured by almost splitting workouts into more obvious sections of let's say like a strength section, a hypertrophy section, and then a functional section, where maybe across the 12 weeks, the strength and the hypertrophy sections wouldn't change. Like you keep the pull-ups and the bench press in, but then the the functional section would maybe change on a more regular basis. But I feel like because multiple changes have been made, it maybe reduces the effectiveness of the strength and hypertrophy side of things a bit more than necessary. Then the it is Natasha's program, it is however she wants to to set it up. I don't think in this case there is a right or a wrong. If I say to you, what's two plus two? We can all agree that two plus two is four. That the outcome is four, we know that that's the case. But if I say, how do you get four? Well, I might say two plus two. You might say two times two. You might say one plus one plus one plus one. Although the outcome is the same, we're still gonna total four. We may have different opinions and methods of getting to that four. And that might be what is occurring here. The desired outcome is likely gonna be the same from the workout if I were to program it or if Natasha were to program it. But how we get to that desired outcome might be a bit different. I like two plus two. I think Natasha might like one plus one plus one plus one. Not right or wrong, it's just preference. And you find that it's quite a common thing in the fitness. There are so many different ways to do different things. I think it's almost really hard to dictate what is the one way to do anything because I think in a lot of cases, there is no one way. There are multiple ways. So I think as like a quick overview, I think the hypertrophy perspective of this program it is a bit limited, which someone actually did comment on a recent video when I spoke about the, the menstrual cycle. Someone spoke about how they were a bit disappointed with Natasha's shift and her hypertrophy side of her training plans being a bit limited, which I, I do I do understand. And I kind of raised this in previous discussions when I have spoken about her programs before. I think the strength perspective is a bit more standard. It's a bit more in place. I get the higher sets. I get the lower reps. I think that's all good. No stress there. The one thing I kind of struggle with is, is maybe the, the frequency of changes from the functional side of things. Although it's not my area of expertise, I think this is probably what it's this program's best suited for. And that kind of goes into the realm of because strength and hypertrophy follow so many similar principles, I feel like a lot of those principles have maybe been pushed to the side slightly to favor principles that might better align with optimizing functional training, which although is still gonna be effective for strength and hypertrophy training, could potentially reduce the effectiveness to then favor 
effectively functionally training. Again, it does what it says on the tin. I think Natasha's programs consistently tick a lot of boxes. I think they're always consistently good. And regardless of whether I agree or disagree with certain things, I still, in a lot of cases, recommend people, if they want to, have a look at her programs. Because as a creator, I'm a big fan of Natasha. I think she does a lot of good things and she speaks about a lot of important things. And she backs what she says with evidence, which I love to see. I think as a trainer, from a workout's perspective, her and I have very different goals and very different approaches. But just because we have different approaches doesn't mean that you're still not going to get to the same end result and the same outcome. We get to four using different methods and in different ways. And the other argument is it does a lot of things well, which we know. It doesn't do things optimally. But do you need to do things optimally? Let's talk about that. Because that goes into comment question of the week, and which isn't really a question, but it's something I want to discuss. People seem to put way too much pressure on themselves to do optimal workouts. If you're just out to stay healthy, get in better shape, also have fun with it, you don't need the gym and a fancy selection of workout equipment. I don't understand the mentality to go hard or go home when it comes to fitness. Just find something you're happy with. To be honest, I agree. I'm a big fan of optimizing my workouts, and I think there's a lot of merit in doing so, optimizing things, but you don't need to. What's optimal for you might not be optimal for me. I think at the end of the day, if you enjoy what you're doing, if it helps you achieve your goals and you can remain consistent with it, therefore it's sustainable, I think that's that's pretty bloody good in my eyes. Sure, you could probably make things better if you really want to, but if making things better sacrifices any of these three things, is it worth it? No, you don't need to do optimal workouts. No, nothing needs to be optimized. I think sure there is merit in learning how to optimize movements just to make things a bit better if you want to, but you don't need to. I think at the end of the day, it's your body these are your goals and this is your journey. You must enjoy it as best as possible. You must get to the end result in the best possible means whilst enjoying the process along the way. Because it's meant to be fun, it's meant to be enjoyable, it's meant to be making you healthy, happy, and it's meant to be something you can maintain for the rest of your life because you genuinely love it. Putting pressure on yourself to make things optimal or perfect may not help. But again, if you want to do so, you certainly can. Take my tips with almost like a, a grain of salt. They, they can certainly help a lot of people, but you don't have to incorporate them if you don't want to. It really is up to you. That is it. That is the video. It's a bloody lengthy one. I do apologize. If at any point you like the video, then please let me know you like the video by liking the video. 1300 likes is the goal, so if we reach that, I would very much appreciate it. If you haven't already, please do consider clicking the red button down below to subscribe to the channel, and maybe even the bell next to it so you get notified when I upload every week twice a week. And if you two have a question you want me to answer at the end of the next video, then please do consider dropping it down below in the comment section for comment question of the week, and I shall do so. Thank you for tolerating me. Thank you for tolerating me color matching the ghost today, and thank you for tolerating the video.